קודם כל אני רוצה להודות לאיגוד הקרדיולוגים ובמיוחד נועה ליאל שהיא כבר סיפרה שאנחנו חברים לפני כמה, הרבה שנים וגם לפלו וחבר שלי אבי שמעוני ממרכז רפואי סורוקה שעזר לי עם התרגום אז אם יש בעיות We always blame the fellow. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to switch over to English now. Uh, he asked me if I So I decided instead of the usual uh, guidelines talk, and I'll explain why in a minute, to give a little bit of a behind-the-scenes talk. So I call this talk the Right Heart Guidelines, the WikiLeaks approach. When uh, Avi first uh, emailed me my picture that they put in the Israel Heart Society website, I showed it to my wife, and she said, you yeah, know, that guy looks a little bit funny. So then I showed it to, uh, to uh, my two colleagues here, Dr. Langleben and Dr. Benzikin uh, from, uh, from my hospital, and they said, why? Did the Israel Heart Society invite Ahmadinejad to present? <laughs> and I said to them, well, it doesn't matter because you guys are going to be traveling with him. <laughs> so the inspiration for this talk actually came from the Haggadah. <clears throat> I know we're in Tel Aviv, but uh, I can still talk about the Haggadah. Um, so it says, uh, uh, when after the son asks his four questions as part of the answer, uh, it says, uh, So we all know how to read guidelines. So I thought I'd give a little bit of a behind-the-scenes uh, look at the guidelines rather than just reading it. But uh, we'll go through some of, the, some of the highlights of the guidelines as well. So for who do we need guidelines? Also from the Gada. These are the people who need the guidelines. Because we're all different. We have Chacham, we have Rasha. We have Tam, we also have Veshein Oli Yod So the guidelines were written for all these people. And I call guidelines the great equalizer. In general, they make bad doctors better and good doctors worse, because the good doctors say, uh oh, I have to follow the guidelines. So it's kind of like a regression to the mean. Now, the other reason why we need, why we need the guidelines, the basic challenge of guidelines, is take from the, the basic myofibril and turn that function of the basic myofibril into a comprehensive echocardiographic report that the referring physician actually understands and, and can make clinical decisions based upon. So we all know about the practice guidelines. Uh, ACCHA put them out. ESC is organized basically in, 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 the, same, in the same structure. We have going uh, across the x-axis the, the class of the guidelines going from class 1 to class 3. Class 1 means the, uh, that the treatment uh, is uh, far outseeds the risk. Uh, class 3 is the risk is greater than, than, the, than the benefit. And going down the, uh, going down the y-axis, we have the level of evidence, level A, B, and C. We all know, or we all think intuitively, that this, doesn't approve, uh, th that this doesn't really apply to echocardiography because we're not really doing an intervention, we're not giving treatments or anything like that. But the risk in, in echocardiographic guidelines really is the decision-making process after the physician gets that report. What am I going to do with that? If it's an inappropriately reported echo, then a patient may be sent for surgery that he doesn't need or may not get surgery that he does need or make the same thing for, with, for medications. Uh, so the other reason why we need guidelines uh, is because, you know, if everybody had the same visual uh, assessment, then, then there wouldn't be any problems. Everybody would be, be reading uh, ec uh, guide echoes in a uniform fashion. Um, but not everybody is the same, and, and I don't mean to be sexist here by showing that the nekeva is lo meduyeket, but this just happens to be my eyeball on, on, the, uh, on the right and one of my colleagues' eyeballs on the left. And we, we all read echoes very differently, and, and we all know that when we do internal inter-observer variability, there are significant differences within everybody's lab. So this was the process of, of, uh, of writing the right heart guidelines. Um, uh, I come from a center where we have a, a very, very large pulmonary hypertension population. When I did a little audit uh, from our echo lab database, I found that 20% of all the echoes that we did over a one-year period had a PA pressure of more than 50, which is, which is a huge percentage. And in 2005, uh, Roberto Lang, who instantly uh, uh, trained in medical school uh, in, at, uh, at Hadassah, um, he published uh, the first, uh, the, sorry, the, the second ASC chamber quantification guidelines, uh, and uh, they included a very small section of the right heart. 
And when we looked at that, everybody, everybody had been using an RV dimension of 40 millimeters as their upper limit of normal. Now we're being told that it's 33. So everybody went from reading normals to calling to saying, you know, everybody has a dilated right ventricle. So uh, I, 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 when I was uh, sitting on the guidelines committee, we were having some informal discussions, and, and I was complaining. And you know what they always say is, uh, if you complain too much, they put you on a committee. So uh, even worse, they, they may actually ask you to chair the committee. So I put together a proposal for a right heart guidelines because uh, right heart really is, is critical and, and people are waking up to the importance of the right heart. So I got a letter from the uh, president of the ASC asking me to chair the committee and I, I started like, shaking. Uh, I had never even sat on a writing group, but uh, after speaking with some of my more senior colleagues, uh, I, I decided to, uh, to accept. Uh, they actually assigned me my writing group members, uh, some of which I knew, some of which I didn't. Um, two of them, uh, Wyman Lai, had chaired the pediatrics document, which is a fantastic document, uh, and he actually was my mentor at the beginning uh, in getting me started on this. And I also had Nelson Schiller as, uh, as the senior member on the group, and Nelson is, is really a legend in, in, in hemodynamics, and he wrote, he, he chaired the very first chamber quantification guidelines, uh, which was published in the late 80s. It's also a challenge when you work with, with legends like that, have, they have their own ideas and uh, it's very hard to get them to deviate and Elise Foster who replaced him was amazed that I was able to get Nelson to get anything done. Um, so I requested additional members and my most important uh, request actually was uh, getting one of my fellows on, on, this, uh, on this guidelines and, and this was, was quite challenging. Uh, I had a fellow named John Afalalo who was finishing a master's in epidemiology and he's, he's such a fantastic fellow. Uh, in, in all ways. And I had to go to the president of the American Society of Echocardiography, who at that time was, uh, was William Zogby, and I said, I have this guy, uh, I want to do meta-analyses on, on, on the groups because there's no normative data. I have this guy who is the perfect guy for this. And he said, fine. I said, I have to be upfront with you. He is a fellow. He said, no. You can't have a fellow on the guidelines. And I had to convince him, and then finally he said, well, you know, if you convince the other members of your writing group, then it's okay. So I had to convince them as well. First they said, well, you know, he's only going to be doing statistics. I'm not sure that qualifies for authorship. So we'll just give him an, an acknowledgement. And I said, no, he's going to be an author. And I actually assigned him one of the sections. And, and it was really by far the best decision. Then you go through the process trying to contact the members, and they don't respond. You try and contact them again. In fact, one of the members of the writing group, it took me a full year before I can actually reach him. Uh, we signed the sections, tried to, then we tried to contact members again, signed the sections again, lots of teleconferences. One of the members in the writing group, in fact, didn't show up for any of the meetings or the teleconferences. Um, then we completed the initial review, uh, we added uh, the meta-analysis fairly late in the process, and finally we submitted the document about a year, a little bit over a year after we first started this. So this was the next challenge. Uh, you know, you all know when you submit a paper for publication, it gets reviewed by two or three, maybe four reviewers. I had 51 reviewers of this document. So this uh, lists all the disclosures of all the reviewers. So if you think of how many comments you get with two or three reviewers, imagine how many comments you get with 51 reviewers. First it goes, so the process was that uh, I got eight pages of comments initially, but uh, 150 comments, which I had to respond to. So I responded to all of them, and I got eight more pages of comments after I responded to them. Then uh, finally, after it got approved, after, after about two, three months, I got uh, three pages. Then it goes after the guidelines committee reviews it, then the board of directors reviews it. So then I got three pages of comments from the board of directors, which I responded to. And then I got two more pages of, of comments from the board of directors. So it was completed uh, in April of 2010, and in, in fact, one of, one of the benefits of this long, uh, long delayed process was the fact that more data had been published during the interim, and we added those onto the, to the meta-analyses, in particular for the 3D echo. So there was one issue in, 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 in JACE in February where they had three or four articles on 3D echo of the right ventricle, so we were able to add that in and, uh, and further uh, strengthen uh, the paper. So finally, this was published in July 2010. You can see my co-authors here. Um, this was endorsed by the European Association of Echocardiography, with which uh, the Israel Heart Society is affiliated uh, through, via the ESC, and by the Canadian Society of Echocardiography. So the purposes of the guidelines document um, were, were fivefold. One was to describe the acoustic windows and the echocardiographic views required for the optimal evaluation of the right heart, and optimal you can put in quotes. 
describe the echocardiographic parameters required in routine and directed echocardiographic studies and the views to obtain these parameters to assess RV size and function, to critically assess the available data from the literature, and, and, and virtually all the numbers that we have in this are, are completely different from the previous guidelines, and to present the advantages and disadvantages of each measure or technique. We recommended which right side of measure should be included in the standard echo report. And uh, most importantly as well, we provided revised reference values for right-sided measures with cutoff limits representing 95% confidence intervals based on all the current available literature. So what the guidelines are not, it is not a detailed technical manual, and there's an excellent uh, technical manual, uh, uh, excellent article written by uh, Ken Horton uh, in the sonographer pages of the Ameri uh, Journal of American Society of Echo a year before. Fantastic, and I recommend reading this. It's not a textbook of individual conditions, so we don't say for pulmonary hypertension, you should do this. For congenital heart disease, you should do this and break it down. Uh, the, the, amongst the greatest weaknesses of this is we do not have gender-specific values. We don't have values adjusted to BSA. And we don't, we, we don't have sufficient data to separate things into mild, moderate, or severe. We do not have patient-level data. All we have are pooled data, which are really is based on means, plus or minus standard deviations. And this really is unfortunate. In the previous guidelines, in fact, when you look at the 2005 one, they have mild, moderate, severe for RV enlargement, which, which is kind of funny because that entire table, which, which everybody was basing all their decisions, is based on a paper from 1988 with 40 subjects. So what we did is we reviewed the literature to extract all the studies with either normal reference values or normal control populations. It was really normal reference values. So there are a whole bunch of papers written on scleroderma or, or one condition or another, and we looked at, we took the normal controls from that. We excluded all, all uh, groups where, where there were fewer than 20 patients, which did create a bit of an embarrassment for me uh, in the TAPSI section because TAPSI was first uh, described by Sanjeev Kahl, who was the incoming president of the American Society of Echo at that time and one of the reviewers. And I got this email from him saying, you know, how come I don't see my name in the references? Um, so I said, but I thought it was there. But then I realized when we went back and did the meta-analysis, we excluded his paper. So we had to uh, reference it in, in the first sentence of the TAPSI section saying that when Frickal first described TAPSI. Um, then what we did is we extracted the means and standard deviations uh, from studies with comparable methodology. Um, then my fellow John performed a meta-analysis of all the normal subjects. Uh, he derived lower upper reference values, uh, and, and uh, were, uh, they were, these were derived. Um, and obviously, in some cases, the upper reference value is the relevant one. Uh, for example, in, uh, in, in MPI, uh, in most others, it's a lower reference value. And then we did something which was a little bit different, and we really wanted to assess how robust these 95% these confidence intervals are. So we did a further meta-analysis around the upper and, and lower reference values to, to really see how, how robust those cutoffs are and, and how much you can rely on them. In the rare situation, for example, in Fiorivina Cava, our estimation of RA, RA size, uh, RA pressure, I'm sorry, uh, where there was insufficient data, we kind of uh, used expert consensus. And when we also, the, the writing group members, uh, looked at the numbers and decided, do they make sense? Do they not make sense? When we weren't sure, we went to outside experts, for example, for right mature ejection fraction. We asked Asha Gopal. Uh, for RVOT dimension, we asked Danita Jaeger Sanborn, who would, didn't, did the ARVC um, paper. Um, but in general, this was based on as evidence-based as one can get, given the fact that there was very little literature. So these are the areas that we covered. Um, we covered RV dimension, RA dimension, estimation of RA pressure, RV wall thickness, estimation of PA pressure and PVR right ventricular systolic function and right ventricular diastolic function. We're going to go through some of these uh, in, in brief. This is the main table. This is the summary of the reference limits for recommended measures of right side destruction function, which you see right at the beginning of the paper. And this, really, this slide really is the take-home message of the guidelines. So let's start off with RV size. You can see over here on the upper left panel, a small looking right ventricle, uh, right ventricle. In the upper right panel, you have a right ventricle that looks kind of proportional. And uh, on the, in the lower panel, you see a right ventricle that maybe even looks a little, little bit bigger than the left ventricle. I always tell everybody to use all the information uh, when you're reading an echo. And if you look at the dates and times, 
these are all just minutes apart. They're all the same patient, just with ch by changing the uh, rotation of the trans uh, of the trans of the uh, of the probe. So, one of the challenges was how do we standardize measurement of RV size? Is this a small, medium, or large right ventricle or normal right ventricle? And the reason why you have this is based on the fact that, again, in another Passover analogy, the right ventricle is loosely based on a, on a pyramid. It has a bit of a pyramidal shape. So it really depends when you're cutting the right ventricle through the apex, what part of the pyramid are you cutting through? Are you cutting through a more narrowed portion, a middle portion, or really through the apex of, of the triangle? So we tried to define what we call the right ventricular focus view. So what, what we uh, recommended is shifting away your focus from the, stent, from the left ventricle, which is what we normally do in the, in the apical four-chamber view, and rotating the probe a little bit towards the right ventricle in order to maximize the RV free well. You can see you often lose left ventricle, uh, left ventricle uh, lateral well. It's important, though, that you don't foreshorten, and it's important also you don't see the, the, uh, the LVO2, so it's not a five-chamber, it's just a rotated four-chamber towards the right ventricle. And this is where we recommended the measurement in the basal third, the maximum dimension, and based on the, the analysis, we came up with an upper reference value of 42 millimeters. You can also do RVOT. Uh, this is measured in short axis, uh, and I just want to really say that uh, the presentations that we heard earlier today really highlighted the, the need for guidelines, and the take-home message of the guidelines also is that we need more work because these guidelines are really are just a starting point. Um, so this is the RVOT, which you can do from the short axis. You can also do it from the parasternal long axis, which is what was uh, recommended for ARVC and a distal diameter, which uh, is best used when you're calculating your, your QPQS. And we have uh, cutoff values for these. So the important thing really is in the apical four chamber to use a, uh, the RV focused view. RV wall thickness can be measured either subcostally or in parasternal lung axis, either, e either 2D or M mode. And really uh, both methods came out with uh, a five millimeter upper limit of normal. We did not have a lower reference limit in Ull's anomaly, for example, but that's really quite rare. Uh, the right atrium. Or, um, the right atrium, we looked at uh, the end systolic area of the right atrium. We also looked at uh, major and minor dimensions. In our lab, we tend to, we, we have been tending to use the major and minor dimensions, but we recently switched over to right atrial area when it's technically feasible. Right atrial area, you trace along the plane of the tricuspid annulus. You don't go into the leaflets, and you trace along the intraatrial septum around the back wall and uh, back around the side. We came up with an upper reference limit of 18 centimeters squared. Again, we do not have indexes based on body surface area. And for RA minor and major dimensions, we had a major of 5.3, which is the length, and a minor of 4.4, which is the width. Estimation of right atrial pressure. This is, as I said, it was one of the ones that uh, uh, required uh, an expert consensus. I'm going to have to speed up. Um, there was a lot of controversy when we decided uh, is I'm uh, part of the original Mass General Mafia, um, and uh, the, the leader of the Mafia, Bob Levine, would always say, when faced with the choice between simplicity and accuracy, simplicity will always win. So what we did is uh, we, we simplified a, a fantastic paper by Brennan in Chicago, where he came up with seven different categories. We lowered it to three different categories, and we said everybody should use the mid-range and put a number in. And there was a lot of pushback from a lot of people who reviewed this paper, including people on the board who just did not want to let go. Uh, we finally said, instead of worrying whether it's three or five millimeters of mercury, why don't you optimize your Doppler gains? It's far more important to, to optimize your CW jet, uh, and that's going to make much more of a difference than the two millimeters of mercury. So this is, again, based on IVC diameter and the degree of collapse. Uh, before it was 17 millimeters, now it's 2 .1 mil, uh, two, uh, 21 millimeters, and uh, our recommended ranges are 3, 8, and 15. I don't always use 3, 8, and 15. Sometimes I'll say, no, it looks more like a 5, or no, it looks more like 10. So again, several times within the guidelines paper, it says over and over again, use your judgment. Integrate all the information. Uh, RV systolic function, there are global and regional methods. Global TAPSI is, is, is very nice, it's very reproducible. The panel on the left was actually done offline using anatomical M mode on a GE platform. On the right was uh, live using M mode cursor. Um, you can see that the lower reference limit was 16, but again, looking at that meta analysis around the lower reference limit, maybe 15, maybe 18. I find 16 to be kind of low. Less than 16 is definitely abnormal, but 18 is sometimes abnormal as well. 
um, tissue velocity of the lateral annulus. You can see there's a far more data looking at using, uh, using pulse Doppler than, than offline color-coded Doppler and uh, lower re reference limit of 10. Um, it's pulse Doppler was the one recommended as opposed to the color-coded uh, offline because of lack of data on color-coded offline. Fractional area change um, has prognostic information and has some correlation studies with, with MRI. Lower reference limit of 35% uh, was used and is one of the recommended measurements, although it is somewhat time-consuming. Uh, the MPI uh, on the right side can be done either by pulse Doppler or tissue Doppler. And here in this side, we're looking at the upper reference value, um, where by pulse Doppler was 0.4, by tissue Doppler 0.55. Because uh, Nelson Schiller was on the committee and he uh, he really does not believe in in, in MPI, uh, we decided and and some people don't say that it's actually a strong measure of RV systolic function. It's really of a global function. We decided to say that this can be one of the quantitative measures, but it should not be the sole quantitative measure used to assess RV systolic function. 3D echo. Um, we have nine uh, studies. There were a bit of, a bit of a mix of different uh, techniques. There were 500 patients. Low reference value was 44%, which is very similar to that that we see with it with MRI. And uh, while we we did not recommend this because we thought there was still too much uh, variability in, in the techniques, we did say that for individual patients, if you wanted to follow serial volumes, that might be uh, an appropriate method. Uh, strain, you can see the main weakness of strain. Uh, we did we had insufficient data for 2D strain, but the main weakness for for uh, Doppler-derived strain is we could come up with lower reference limits, but look at the huge range around those reference limits. This was, so this we thought was completely useless for, for clinical use and was recommended only for select uh, uh, labs with experience for research applications. So these, in summary, were the recommended uh, methods for ass assessment of systolic function, TAPSI, S prime, fractional area change, and MPI. Uh, diastolic function, uh, incredibly, when we look at the number of patients, there was more data for diastolic function than for anything else. But practically, we all know if anybody's tried to post the tricuspid inflow, it's you, you almost never get a decent signal. You get an E, and you can do it by tissue doppler, get an E prime. So that might be doable. Uh, so uh, just to, to clo uh, close up, the uh, to perform and report in all patients, RV size uh, based on basal dimension, RA size, uh, RV systolic function with some quantitation moving beyond the eyeball, SPAP, which I didn't have a time to get into, um, uh, adding the RA pressure rather than just uh, assuming 10 as is done in many labs, uh, and you can add additional measures in patients with right heart pathology. Uh, in conclusion, the guidelines allowed us to uh, move beyond the eyeball estimation of the right heart parameters, allowed for a common methodology and terminology amongst labs, establish reference values and normal ranges for right heart parameters, and in very importantly, to direct future research in r improving and refining current methodology. The final point is you still have to rely on your common sense and judgment in addition to the quantification. It's amazing how often we get a quantitative measure and we upgrade or downgrade based on what we see. Uh, these are the patients who, uh, these are the people who uh, helped prepare the guidelines. Uh, and finally, I invite you all on behalf of the Scientific Session Committee uh, to come to Montreal uh, at the American Society of Echo meeting this June. Uh, for those of you who speak French, we have a, fresh, a special French section as well, and it's going to be a fantastic meeting. Thank you.